Well, thank you guys for uh, joining us today. Uh, it's great to have Jason and Joyce and John with us. And we're just excited to hear about this amazing story of uh, really what, what took place uh, about 15 years ago now. Uh, is that right? Five years ago. Five, five years ago. Did I say fifth? fifth sorry. <laughs> I, I went to Central Bible College, I said. Uh, we didn't have math classes. Um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, w- w- real quick, uh, can everyone introduce themselves just kind of so uh, we everyone knows who who's who here? Oh, I'm Joyce Smith. I'm the mom. Uh, I'm John Smith. I'm the boy that obviously drowned. <laughs> And I'm Jason Noble. I'm the pastor in the story that, that pastored them through that. So, uh, Joyce, John, tell, tell us a little bit what, what kind of took place uh, through this remarkable story. Give us kind of an overview of, of what, what un- unfolded. Uh, so, me and three friends were out on the ice um, on Lake St. Louis. Uh, we were having a great time. Um, and then the ice gave way and all three of us fell in. Uh, one of my buddies was able to um, self-rescue. Me and my other friend were 25 to 50 feet away from shore. Uh, we were pushing each other up just to stay afloat um, until I, I couldn't do it anymore, and I had drowned. I had lain under the water for uh, 15 minutes. They they found me, which was a miracle in itself. They rushed me to shore, um, and then they worked on me for an additional 45, rushed me to a local hospital where I lay lifeless for a total of an hour and eight minutes. Um, they brought my mom in, she prayed, and instantly I had a pulse. 16 okay. days later, I walked out completely healed. 40 days from that, I um, was cleared from all medical doctors. That's just incredible. Amazing. John, John, what was it like? So, you're you're pushing yourself up with your friends in the water, just trying to get a breath of air. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're, you're just trying to survive at that moment. What was going through your mind in that? I mean, that, those are those are moments that no child's ever prepared for. You know, the the best way I can describe it, um, and I really had to reflect on it because I've gotten that question quite a bit, mm-hmm. and I, I really never thought of it at first. Um, you know, it's just it's crazy because just what you said, no no one's prepared for it. You know, you're not going about your day and thinking, oh, I've got to fight for my life in the next hour. You know, and just being in that water with with us, our, our mindset, you know, we all have that fight or flight instinct and our instinct was to fight for our lives. And, you know, the hardest thing for all of us was, you know, our our, our minds are telling us you, you need to fight. You're, you're going to survive. You want to survive. Mm-hmm. But it, it's the hardest thing when your body's saying you, you just can't, you know, the hypothermia is sitting in. You can't feel your arms. You can't feel your legs. You can't do anymore. And you're just helpless you know, that moment of when you realize that it's over, that, that's the scariest thing because, you know, you're, you're, everything is going through your mind in that moment. And so for that, for us, it was just, it was terrifying. I, I have to be. Jason, you were, you were their pastor at that time. Yes. What, what were, how do you, I mean, Joyce gets the news, you know, this accident, of course, has happened. You're trying to pastor them through this. How, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, we so we got the call that John had went down, and I kind of, I'd only been their pastor for three months, so I was brand new to the church. Um, they hadn't really, I, don't, I hadn't even met John officially, and I get this call that John had went down in the water and that they needed, uh, that things were not good, and so I was kind of just monitor, monitoring through the day, and found out that they had airlifted John to, to Cardinal Glenn in the children's hospital in town and that I needed to get down there quick because it didn't look good. And when I walked on the scene, um, Joyce had just gotten done talking to the doctors um, and ha- she walked out and she said, um, listen, like we've just gotten really bad news. Like the news is, is that John um, is not going to make it. There's a 1% chance that he makes it if he makes it overnight He'll be a vegetable for the rest of his life. Um, every organ in catastrophic failure. I mean, just like his muscles were exploded. I mean, like everything that could be going wrong was going wrong. Joyce had walked in and prayed, Holy Spirit, bring my son back to life. But then we were facing that. And I think that the lesson that we we really felt like God told us afterwards is like, listen, 
when I do miracles, it's usually one miracle at a time. We all want the big miracle. Mm -hmm. We all want things just to turn around. But sometimes, you know, we found that God works in what we call a tapestry of miracles and you can't give up. Um, So we took a group of pastors in the room and we just said, listen, this boy is not going to die. We're going to hold on. We're going to pray. We're going to believe. Um, and we took a, a, this group of pastors in the room. We started praying over him. We prayed that God would restore his lungs and that God would restore his brain. Yeah. We, we still believe that God can do those kind of things. I yeah. mean, we were in desperate need for a miracle. And as we prayed for John's lungs, um, I heard him over breathe the respirator. And I turned around and in the room, I saw two angels that were floor to ceiling. I mean, just, wow. and, and I'm looking at those angels and you know, they had a sword and a shield. They were on guard. And there were the same two angels I'd seen in a room um, in Port Angeles, Washington, four years before that, where I'd gotten called in to pray for a lady, 85 years old, who was in a coma as she was dying. And mm. look, bent down to her ear and I said, ma'am, like you're on the edge of eternity. And so like it, you need to accept the Lord now if you want to, because you have 15 minutes left to live. And if I said, if you'd like to do that, squeeze my hand. And if she did that, I saw the same two angels in her room and within literally 15 minutes, the color started coming back into her body. Wow. An hour later, she was awake. And when she woke up, she said, I've given my heart to Jesus. And amazing. the next day she walked out. That's amazing. And so there's no equation to a miracle, yeah. but like we're sitting there going, okay, like God, you're doing something right now. And John overbreathed the respirator, his eyes open. We continued to pray like, Lord, like recreate his brain and over his head. We felt just, we saw millions of colors. Like I was just knitting his brain back together. Mm. Again. And after that, I mean, John opened his eyes, shoulders came off the mat and the rest of the bed. And I walked out to Joyce and I said, and we both agreed, we don't know how, we don't know when, but John is walking out of this hospital. He's going to be healed it's amazing because of God showing up. And you just have to hold on to that. Yeah, It wasn't, it wasn't done then. I mean, the, no. we knew what the outcome was going to be, but we had to fight and we had to partner with God to see that happen. It's amazing. So, Joyce, for, for you, um, this uh, had to have been such a challenging emotional time. Um, you, you had adopted John. Yes. But you're his mother. Yes. And uh, you've invested in him and raised him and love him so much. What's going through your mind when you get the news that they're about to pronounce your son dead? Well, you know, it's you're never prepared for that. Even if you know that your child's terminally ill, mm-hmm. you know, and you've been going through it for months, you're never ready for that as a mother to let go. And even when you get the call that you're never expecting or never want, you're still not wanting to let go. And, you know, the God, God will prepare you for things. You know, in the middle of what we're going through right now, this isn't taking God by surprise. Mm-hmm. He knows what tomorrow is, and he knew this with John. He knew what he was going to do with John when we adopted him at five and a half months old. We didn't Mm -hmm. know what was on the radar, but he did. And he'd been preparing us, and and me, and we'd been in a Bible study, uh, Believing God, and by Beth Moore. And I'd been doing these homework pages every day, and at the beginning of the homework, you would recite these things. I believe God is who he says he is. I believe God can do what he says he can do, and I'm believing God. And so this is getting down in my spirit. So when this day comes, it's like I've been taken from the Bible study, and I'm on a field trip now. We're going to put this in practice. And so when I walked in the room, I wasn't ready for the, I'm sorry, we're going to call time of death on John, that wasn't in my mind. What was in my mind was I was desperate to see God move for mm, me yeah, and see that God can do the things that he can say, can, says he can do. So when I walked up to the bed and they told me I could talk to him, my first thought was the Holy Spirit that came and raised Christ Jesus from the dead. And I thought, God, you're either who you say you are or you're not. Amen. And I all my life, he'd always been God to me and always done the things he could say he said, d- could do with the things he said he could do. And so when I walked up and got a hold of his feet and started praying for him, I started crying out to the Holy Spirit because mm. I knew, I knew that's where yeah. the power laid. And so when I prayed for him, immediately the pulse came back. Yeah. I mean, to the shock of everyone in the room. 
after an hour and eight minutes of no heartbeat and all of a sudden they're hearing, you know, the machines going off. It was God being grace, showing his grace, love and mercy and showing this whole room. You do everything you can do. And when you're finished, step back and I'll show you what I can do. That's such an incredible, bold faith, Joyce. That's amazing. I need to have you pray for Jason's poster. It keeps coming down. Oh, my word. <laughs> Maybe you can do a miracle. <laughs> and I tried to, like I told you, Pastor Nick, I tried to get a frame for it, but you can't get anything on Amazon right now. So, well, the way you have it set, Jason, with the shadows and the lighting, it, like I thought it was genuinely framed. I thought it looked really nice. I did, too. Yeah. I it is it was, framed. I thought it was framed. I thought it was completely framed. <laughs> it is framed. <laughs> So, so John, the, the moment, so, I mean, your mom's prayed for you. I mean, this is an incredible miracle. Uh, your pastor's prayed for you. Like, so many things are happening physically. Then there's the moment you wake up. What's the first thing you remember seeing and doing in those you know, early the moments? The best way I can describe it to you is that it was like I was in a TV show or one of those movies where uh, someone's just been in an accident and your eyes are just slowly opening to a hospital, you know, that beep and the ceiling, you know, and it was... For me, I knew that I had like fallen through the ice. I knew that I would drowned, but I didn't know the extent of the miracle. I didn't know who knew I was there. I didn't know how long I had been in the hospital. Mm-hmm. I, I, all I knew is that me and my two friends, we fell through the ice. And that night I was just a little bit, they were finally taking me off the propofol and I was getting all of my, um, all, everything kind of back slowly but surely. They were pulling me out of the coma and then um, my mom was there. I was really scared that night. She came over and she explained to me everything that happened. You know, uh, I asked her, I said, do my friends know I'm here? She said, well, the world knows you're here. It was just, it was, it was little things like that, that she just kind of helped ease my, my mind and my conscience. um, Just knowing that I was safe, Yeah. you know, and then from then going on forward, you know, Jason was always there when I needed him. Uh, Mom was always there. Friends always came and visited. Um, And then shortly after that, I was released. How widespread, explain to everyone, if they're they're not familiar, how widespread was the news of this? This went everywhere. I mean, it went across the the world. I mean, it went to different countries, Sweden, Denmark, Finland. I mean, and then all over the United States from Good Morning America to, you know, Good Morning LA. Like everyone was, what was shocking is that the doctors were calling this a bona fide miracle. Um, No one had ever seen anything like this before. So, you know, the the non-believers were starting to become believers and that's what makes this amazing. For you, what were some of the emotions that you were feeling during that time? You know, I, I really didn't realize how much news was taking hold of this. My, my only goal was to get out of the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at that point when I started to get conscious, we had a couple interviews with local television stations, but it really didn't hit until a couple months after, um, about a year, a couple of years after really, you know, we had spotty stuff here and there. Um, but really when, when we signed for the book and movie, it really picked up. Um, it was a huge blessing. And for me, the whole thing was, you know, I sat down with a lot of my mentors and one of them was Devon Franklin, just telling you to stay humble and stay hungry, you know, staying humble and remembering who you are. You know, I'm, I'm back home from college and I'm in my bedroom. I'm not in a million dollar house. I'm not in anything special, but just remember where you came from. Yeah. Um, and staying hungry and chasing after what God has for you, because when you keep doing that, you know, he'll bless you and he'll keep you, keep the path straight. And so I just remember those every day. Now, when, when that, this all happened, you weren't listen, necessarily living for Jesus no. at that time. No. Tell us a little about that journey. Absolutely not. I mean, I was not – my whole life, I wanted to be a good basketball player. It's something me and my dad shared. It's something that we loved. We still love. We still talk about it to this day. Um, I had dreams to, you know, play college sports. And, you know, those – I felt like those were taken from me, but they were taken for a good reason. I grew up in an assembly as I got home. Um, I did church every Sunday, uh, youth and children's group every Wednesday. I mean, I did it. I did it all. Um, but, the, but one thing that really stuck with me is this abandoned spirit that I feel like a lot of people have. And it was specifically strong for me because of me being adopted and my birth family, um, my birth mom, my birth dad. I don't know anything about them. And so it wasn't that my parents did anything wrong. It was simply I just didn't understand and so growing up, I hated holidays and birthdays. Like I just, I didn't like them. I didn't understand them. I didn't like them. They were not a joy for me. And so I would go to church and I would get close to these pastors. Well, then they would leave. They would be gone. They would move to different churches. They would move to different states. 
and they would just be gone. And so this whole spirit of abandonment would just constant, it was like a big cycle. Mm -hmm. And so finally around the time of of fifth grade, I kind of just fell away from the church. I had really gotten deep into the game of basketball. I wanted to see where that would take me. Um, And I just pushed myself away from the Lord. And so in turn, sixth, seventh, um, and eighth, eighth, ninth, ninth grade, I was just not living for the Lord at all. Um, I was doing things I shouldn't, hanging out with people I shouldn't, looking at things I shouldn't, talking to people the way I shouldn't. I mean, there was a list. And so it came to the time of the accident. And, you know, afterwards, I just, I wasn't happy. I didn't want to be this guy. I didn't want to have the spotlight. I didn't want to be famous for something God did. I didn't want any of it. And so I went on to ninth grade, still not living for the Lord, running away. Sophomore, the beginning of my sophomore year, I was still running away. And it, it took that summer in between, you know, my freshman and sophomore year to really just kind of get everything back. You know, a dear friend of mine, Emma Riley, invited me to a youth camp and I just, I didn't want to go. Um, I knew what youth camp was about and I was just like, this isn't for me. And so I told her no, really in kind of an arrogant way. And when I did, I just, I, I went to basketball practice that evening and got it all orchestrated this. The coach told me that my team had the week off. And so I got to go to youth camp and it was a great wow. trip. And I'll never forget the day that, you know, some days they, they allowed the kids to go into the sanctuary about 30 minutes before service. So you can pray. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how I ended up there. I still can't, I can remember most of that week, but this, I just can't, I can't remember how I ended up in the front of the sanctuary right by the stairs sitting and I just put my head down and I said, God, if you're there, show me something. And I, I, I'll never forget. He said, God, he said, John, why are you running from me? Mm. And, you know, moving forward, I kind of just ignored it until, you know, it came to the last game of my basketball career. And I got hurt for the last time, realizing that my career was over. And I heard God again say, why are you running from me? And I was heartbroken. I just went home that night and I gave my life back to him. And I did, you know, I just said, whatever you have for me, I'll do. And I'll do it to the best of my abilities. And ever since then, it's been a, a whirlwind. Um, mm. you, it's just been crazy with the book and movie and, you know, still traveling to this day. But I'm extremely blessed to be here and I'm extremely blessed to share share this story. So you, you had this amazing, you know, experience, but but then eventually find the God that that, that rescued you, healed you. How did that moment of committing your life to Christ impact your relationship with your birth mother? Um, you know, I, uh, my fiance, she has a baby sister named Penelope. Uh, mm-hmm. She's about three now. She's uh, amazing. She's a little booger, but I love her. Um, she is. She loves to call me every morning at 7 a.m. And sometimes she gets it right on the dot at 7 a.m., whether I'm up or not. And when Abby's mom was having her, they didn't think her or the baby would make it. Mm -hmm. It was really, it was really that critical at the time. And I just, I I had just gotten my license. I had just turned 16 or whatever. And I was going over there and I just kind of realized what was happening. And, you know, I was praying, you know, the loudest I could at everything that was going on. And I'm pulling into their driveway for some reason. And I just kind of stopped. Like I parked my car at the top of the hill and I just stopped. And I, I remember just sitting there and I was like, okay, God, what's up? And just realizing that his presence was in the car and he had something to tell me. And, you know, he just, I, I sat there for a moment and he said, John, Gail is willing to sacrifice her life and her body to have Penelope. And if it lives, she's going to keep it. I said, well, yeah, I, I hope she'd keep it. And, you know, about five minutes later, I said, I, I just was like, what, what does it do with me? And she said, he said, just listen. And I, I waited a couple more minutes and God said, your mom sacrificed, was willing to sacrifice her life and her body for you and give you away for a chance of life. And, you know, that moment, it really just kind of all hit me because, you know, the story of breakthrough starts at the beginning. Yeah. And the beginning is May 23rd when she chose to give me up for adoption for a chance at a better life, a chance to impact people's life and a chance to share this story. And that's really how I just kind of just, I wouldn't say forgave her, but made peace with everything, Mm -hmm. you know, just really saying, okay, thank you. Yeah. You know, I know you're out there. I know you care, but thank you for this chance at life. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome. So this has just been a a few years now. John, what are you, what are you up to now? What, what's, what's happened from here? Uh, I'm, I'm besides besides turning. signing autographs, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm 
I mean, I did everything, the movie and book tour, but now that that is kind of taking a little bit of a, a, a stand, still not really, but uh, we travel on weekends to churches across the country. Mm -hmm. um, Jason went out of the country, um, but with everything going on, we're just waiting to see what God has for us this next season. Um, but currently I'm finishing up my first year of college online um, yeah. at North Central University, Minneapolis. Awesome. Uh, I am engaged to uh, Abigail. We get married awesome. in October and then I am so cool. Still Jason's assistant, so I'm doing everything right. <laughs> Sweet. So what are, you, what are you studying in school? I am studying at North Central um, Biblical Studies with a minor in business. Cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. So so neat. So, so uh, guys, when, when you think about what people are walking through right now, I mean, there's you guys are supposed to be here. Um, we're we're going to do this in person. Uh, it was the original plan, but yes. of course, uh, those plans have been... Uh, uh, changed as so much, so many other plans have. But when you think about all the people that, that what they're walking through, this virus, the fear that's dominated their lives, uh, what would you guys say uh, in, into this season? Like, what, what kind of things would you speak into people struggling during this season? One of the things I would say is rise up in faith and not in fear, mm -hmm. because. Fear isn't going to do anything for you. Yeah. It's it gets our 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 focus off of Jesus. Yeah. And right now, this world needs Jesus. Amen. I know. Yesterday, with it begin being the beginning of Passover, mm -hmm. uh, we did a viral communion yesterday with yeah. a lot of folks online because, first of all, the number eight in Hebrew means new beginnings. Yeah. Passover. Okay, all these things are coming together at a time that I feel that the Lord is screaming out from heaven. Hey, yeah. listen, turn to me because I'm the only answer. Amen. And he came to this world to give us hope. And if we if we ignore him, all we have is this fear and mm -hmm. what's going to happen tomorrow. But if you turn around and put your faith in God, knowing that maybe you may not know when this virus is going to end, but you know that God. Yeah. He's still in control. I like to say he's large and in charge. Yeah. He hasn't given up his his throne to anyone, and he's going to get us through us. So this is a time to take the faith yeah. and to take the things that God has given you and to rise up in that faith and say, Lord, you're going to get me through this. I Amen. know. I trust you. Amen. I believe in you. Yeah. Amen. You know, I would say to people, too, um, watch what you're thinking, watch what you're saying. The Bible's clear. The power of life and death is in our tongue. So speak life over your situation, life over your family. You know, don't let fear come into your thinking process, especially when you're at home and you're, uh, you know, you don't have uh, kind of all of the pressures of the world coming in. There's a lot of times where you start to think. And in those moments, you have to really think about what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. and, um, in this perspective of speaking life. I mean, I think it's so important to look back and be thankful for what God has done in the past and thankful for all that he's done in our lives. I mean, I think that that is just such a key, uh, a key point, but really taking this and holding on to God's promises to speaking in life. What does that mean? It means taking the scripture and every scripture that speaks to your situation, whether you're sick or you're needing finances or whatever it is, take those scriptures and speak them out over your situation. So what you're thinking about, what you're speaking about, what you're allowing in your home. I mean, fill your house up with praise and worship. I mean, it's like these moments and what we do in these times, um, you know, and I've told Joyce and John, we talked a lot about this, that this is a moment where God is giving us a little bit of a Sabbath too. So don't miss it. Take a little bit of a rest. And, and yeah. he's given us this time to, to get rested up. And you never know what he's going to do in this next season. That's awesome. You know, we, we've been talking about how when, uh, when we were at our worst, God is at his best. Amen. Yes. And um, you guys are a, a pr proof of that. Uh, in today's world, how difficult things can be, that actually sets the stage for God to do his best work. Um, any, any final thoughts, Joyce, John, you know, any, any other kind of closing thoughts before we wrap up and Joyce, I'm going to ask you to pray for us in a second. Uh, you know, I mean, for me, it's just everything they said is completely true, but you know, I'm, I'm attending a Bible. I was attending in person, a Bible college, but you know, I, mom has always said that God's raising an army for these final days on earth. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like this is just a a little stumbling block for what's to come on what God is going to do with this country and this next generation. Um, Specifically, you know, these, this next generation that's about to rise and graduate and start their own churches in this church planning era. It's, it's going to be huge. and, And people need to realize that, you know, the God that they think is dead is surely alive. And, Man. you know, on these last days, we need to be ready because we don't know when he's going to come back. Yeah. Well, thank I you. Oh, good, good, Joyce. echo that, too. You know, one of the courses that John was taking, they were talking about this generation, you know, not being able to do this, not being able to do that, you know, and really coming down on them. And one of the things I think of right now, we need to quit calling this generation snowflakes. Yeah. They're not snowflakes. They're our hope. They're who God is going to raise up to bring in a great awakening. And we need to start speaking life over them and quit speaking death over them. Amen. 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 Well, as we kind of wrap up this uh, the interview, Joyce, could you just pray for, for us? Sure. Pray for everyone watching today and uh, just for the season that we're in right now. Sure. Lord, we just thank you right now because we know that this has not taken you by surprise, this time that we are going through right now with this pandemic. Lord, this is a time when we can come back to you. And Lord, that's what this Passover season is all about. Lord, is remembering what you have done for us in the past and that you, there is nothing in our future, Lord, that you can't take care of and that you hold everything right in the palm of your hand. And so, Lord, we thank you for that right now. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we just come to you and we repent as a nation, Lord, for what we have done, Lord, for the things that are so wrong in our society, Lord, we know you have a great answer for that. And when we turn our hearts back to you, Lord, you're going to come in and do miraculous things here, Lord. You're going to send forth a great awakening, Lord, a great revival. And Lord, we're looking for that right now. So Lord, we thank you. Lord, as we go through this time, help us be ready, Lord Jesus, to recognize what you are, who you are and what you're doing, Lord, and surrender to that, Lord, and not to fall apart in fear, Lord Jesus, but to know that you hold our tomorrows and that everything is going to go according to your plan, according to your purpose, Lord. As your word tells us in Jeremiah 29, 11, you have plans and purpose for us, Lord. And Lord, let us be about that purpose, Lord, of building your kingdom until the day that you return to take us home with you. In my precious name, we ask it. Amen. 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 Thank you guys so much for joining us today. It's such an honor from uh, for, from our church to yours. Just want to say thank you for uh, your incredible story. And it's awesome to thank hear you. what God has done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.